right now to help them take care of their patients, themselves, and their families. We have an emergency in the 215 nursing homes across Connecticut. Our union represents workers in 69 different nursing homes, about 6,000 different workers. And of those 69 facilities, 63 currently have either confirmed COVID cases, 55 of them, or an additional eight where we strongly suspect that there are active COVID-19 cases. The population that our members care for are Medicaid patients, meaning that they are uh, overwhelmingly very low income patients. The majority of our workforce is female. The vast majority of our workforce are black or Latino or working class white folks. And so what that means is that those are populations that generally in our society, both the patients and the workers are not seen as folks that are, are visible, are people that we listen to and the, and the stories that we oftentimes look, look to and, and hear the most easily. And that has got to change immediately if we're going to successfully deal with the COVID-19 public health crisis. These are workers who want to care. Uh, workers are sending us homemade signs like the one uh, uh, of Yvonne Foster, uh, CNA from Windsor Rehab, which is going to be shared on your screen. They want to care for their residents. They want to support their residents. They want to heal the residents and comfort them uh, in what are some very difficult moments, but they need help. There are 81 residents that are confirmed to have passed away in Connecticut nursing homes during the COVID-19 crisis. That's almost a third of the 277 deaths that have taken place statewide. There are 80 nursing homes out of the 215 in Connecticut where there are already confirmed COVID cases, although we believe that there are many, many more nursing homes where there are active cases of COVID-19. And just among our membership of 6,000 nursing home workers, we believe that there are 500 workers who are either currently diagnosed or are in self-quarantine. So I think what we can say is that uh, it is very, very likely that a minimum of 20% of the COVID-19 cases that are active in Connecticut have been through the vector of nursing homes, uh, either in residents or patients, and of course, uh, workers uh, uh, as well. And of course, workers uh, take the virus home to their families. We know that families are the main source of transmission. So we're calling attention to the crisis that is active in the nursing homes. Uh, four things that I'll point to. Number one, uh, personal protective equipment. We have an unforgivable under-resourcing of personal protective equipment in nursing homes. Again, our members want to help. They want to heal the sick, but the, what they're being asked to do right now is unconscionable. Uh, if uh, we can show the photo of uh, Sandria Morton, an LPN in Newington Care Center, who had to fashion her own personal protective equipment last night. She sent this to the union out of a trash bag. You'll see that she does not have any protective, feel, uh, 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 protective shield or covering over her face. And this is not uncommon in terms of, of what nursing home workers are facing. They are being asked by administrators to make their own protective gear out of trash bag, out of um, uh, paper bags, out of old rags for face coverings, out of painter's gear, this is not equipment that is designed to prevent the, spe the spread of a highly contagious uh, pandemic. Based on the number of workers that are ill, we are seeing that there are staffing crises at at least at more than half a dozen nursing homes that we are aware of uh, in terms of just foot places in our union. More than half a dozen of the 69 nursing homes where we represent workers, there are staffing crises. Uh, because of the lack of personal protective equipment and the number of workers that are falling ill. We know that as workers get sick and as their family members get sick, they're going to be hit with out-of-pocket costs. It does not help to cover the cost of free testing for COVID-19 victims who work in nursing homes if they do not have medical coverage, okay? And based on the poor, poor quality of med medical coverage that is available for nursing home workers, they're gonna be facing out-of-pocket costs of up to $20,000 Per family if they're lucky enough to have health insurance. The state has got to do something to provide um, incredible support for workers and, and make those moves now. There's an announcement at the end of last week that DSS was increasing uh, Medicaid rates in nursing homes at 10%, which is a step, but frankly, a far insufficient step. What workers are going to need in nursing homes is a minimum, a minimum of $150 per day per bed in terms of increased Medicaid funding, 
plus any cost in terms of overage so that nursing homes can buy adequate personal protective equipment and get the hazard pay that is necessary to recruit the workforce to come in because workers in nursing homes are literally risking their lives to come into work. The state should absolutely look at whatever transparency and oversight of additional funding. But again, these workers need help, not next week, not tomorrow, right now, today, to save the lives of their residents, to save the lives of workers, to stop the, the, the transmission of COVID-19 from nursing home workers to the general public. We have a number of workers who have uh, volunteered to come today and to talk about what they're facing in their facilities. Uh, I'm gonna start with Chelsea Daniels. Chelsea is an LPN at Fresh River Nursing Home, and she's gonna say a few words about what's taking place in her facility. Chelsea. Hi, my name is Chelsea. Start over. Hi, my name is Chelsea Daniels and I work as a licensed nurse at Fresh River Healthcare. First off, let me say our healthcare workers are sick. This is serious. Our lives are in jeopardy. Every day we work to take care of patients. We go home to our families and we jeopardize their health. We don't have the option to work from home. We're reusing PPE. We are reusing personal protective equipment. Before COVID, the CDC recommendations for PPE was to dispose after each use. We couldn't even leave the patient's room while wearing contaminated PPE. We're reusing masks. Some of us have limited access to gloves. We don't have access to gowns. How can that change overnight? How can those rules change overnight? We know the unsafe conditions that we're working under, yet we still continue to work because somebody has to care for the patients. Before COVID, there were patients that were on precautions and they've been taken off so that we can save PPE. This is not right. So not only are we not protected against COVID, we're not protected against other viruses and bacteria that patients carry every day. We're at risk and nobody seems to care. We have a shortage of staff. If we die, Who's left to take care of the residents and the patients and everybody that requires medical attention? We shouldn't have to beg for PPE and we shouldn't have to beg to be protected. As a nurse, I find it dis disrespectful, degrading, and extremely unappreciative. This needs to change and it needs to change now. We're running out of time. In fact, we're out of time. We are essential workers and we deserve better treatment than this. Thank you. Next, we have Paula Casino, who's a CNA at Apple Rehab of Rocky Hill. Hi, my name is Paula Cousino. I work at Apple Rehab, Rocky Hill. Um, mostly is a lot of the staff. There's no staff there. Everybody is getting sick and they, have, they don't have enough help to take care of these residents. Um, they leave you on the floor by yourself to deal with a whole, like 26, 30 residents at a time. And it's hard. The patients are scared. The staff is scared. Um, we, we don't have enough equipment, like PPE equipment. We have to wear the same mask for going off. Oh. Still going? Oh, okay. And um, what was I? <laughs> we just don't have enough equipment to take care of everybody. And so if they keep wanting us to use the same uh, gowns and everything, and we have to spray them down, we have to wipe them down. Um, I think they need to clean the facility a little bit better too. They don't have enough healthcare staff there. They don't have enough anybody actually. Um, and if something does happen to us, there'd be no way to take care of the residents. And a lot of the staff members are already sick. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paula. Next, we have Yuli Samaski, who is also a CNA at Apple Rehab of Rocky Hill. 
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ulysses Maskew. I am a CNA for um, the pool. Um, we are asking, begging, pleading for PPE equipment. I have been using the face mask for about a week, wiping it down, sanitizing it. We do not have staff. We are two on morning shift. We are two on evening shift. Night shift has one. I don't understand how the residents are supposed to get their proper care in this environment. We are begging, pleading, please. We need the proper equipment. We need the staff. Thank you. We hope to be joined by Ebony Brunson, who is ill at home with COVID-19. She is a CNA at Governor's House in Simsbury. Was Ebony able to join us? It may be that Ebony is not feeling well enough at the moment to, to speak with us. So we'll hope that we can connect uh, her to, to some of the, the reporters if she's feeling well enough later on in the day. Uh, I, I would just uh, wrap up by saying that again, uh, nursing home workers need emerg emergency, immediate, effective, urgent assistance from the state of Connecticut, and they need it today. The time for talk is really over, and what we need is action to make sure that nursing home workers' lives are saved, that the lives of the residents are saved, and that we stem the tide in terms of the, the, the rising occurrence of COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in our state. We'll take any questions. Uh, Rob, it's Matt Karen over at Fox 61. Um, thank you guys for all that you're doing. I first want to start with that. Um, you're frontline healthcare heroes, and we all appreciate that. Um, I wanted to ask you about two nursing homes in particular. I don't know if you represent them or not. Um, Golden Hill Rehab Pavilion in Milford and Whisper in the Pines in East Haven. We know that those are two significant COVID um, outbreaks. I've been talking to families over this past week who've told me they were never informed that their loved ones were sick. They only got a call saying that they were dead. Um, talked to another family who said um, the, their loved one went in there for hip surgery rehab and now is on a ventilator fighting for their life. Um, Another family told me that she was allowed to visit her dying loved one to say goodbye and was never given proper PPE to protect herself. Um, what can you tell me about what is going on inside those two facilities in particular, if anything? So we, we don't represent workers at either of those two facilities, so I can't tell you anything specific about what is going on in either of those two nursing homes. What I will see, say is that uh, uh, nursing homes in general have been the, the most under-resourced part of the healthcare sector uh, for the reason that you've got large numbers of workers and residents that are congregated in the same place. And we know that the elderly are most vulnerable to COVID-19. All of this was knowable. All of it was predictable. National public health officials understood. I, I can't talk right now. National public health officials understood this disease was coming. They did nothing to prepare us. I believe that at this stage, the Trump administration has blood on its hands, and it is time for the, uh, the state to act aggressively to make sure that nursing homes have the resources that they need, because we cannot have a public health policy that is determined by each individual nursing home employer. We need a statewide policy to get every facility in the state the maximum level of resources that it needs to take care of the elderly and to make sure that the workforce is safe and protected. Uh, obviously, if there are any circumstances where residents are becoming ill in the ways that you've described, Matt, uh, it, it, is, it is inhumane on the part of the, and possibly criminal, on the part of the employers in those situations to, to deal with the, the families and the residents in the way that you've just described. Rob, you say in your advisory that healthcare workers and people we care for every day are dying because of low inventory. Um, are you how many staff members are you aware of who have died of covid related symptoms 
We're aware of a number of fatalities across the union. Um, in nursing homes, we, we received word that uh, a worker at West River uh, in, uh, in Milford uh, passed away. She was a nurse who uh, had come through the union's education fund, had been on strike for eight months in 2011, uh, and just recently passed. And we're aware of, of a, a number, a number of different workers who are very active in the union who are quite ill. Uh, my, my fear, and I, I, God knows I hope that I'm wrong, is that, uh, you know, over the next week we may start getting, you know, uh, much more bad news. And I, I hope that, that is not the case. Uh, so we're, we are, are sending out our love and our prayers to all our hundreds of, uh, num hundreds of personal members who are ill. What is the average age of the nursing home workers in your union? Uh, it, it really varies from facility to facility, but you're talking about probably on average uh, upwards of, of 40, well above 40. Rob, I had a question, um, and it completely blocked out of my mind. I'll come, I'll start. Okay. Um, I can jump in. Rob, it's Sue Haig from the AP. I talked to you yesterday about the governor's proposal for the COVID-only homes. I wondered if you had heard anything more about that. And given the fact that homes that aren't COVID-only are having so many shortages, are you uh, confident that these COVID-only homes will have what they need to protect the workers? Thank you. Um, Right now, we're, we're not, and I, I think that, look, I mean, uh, we're seeing that this virus is transmitting uh, at such a rapid rate that, you know, if you've got 81 out of, is my, my understanding is uh, over 80 nursing homes that are confirmed who have had COVID-19 out of, out of the uh, 215 in the state, uh, my guess is, you know, by the time that we're through the weekend, we'll be upwards of 50% of the nursing homes that will be confirmed. Um, you know, almost every facility, I think, is likely to confront uh, th this, this virus. So we better make sure that every single facility has the resources that they need, that workers are not uh, fashioning their own protective gear out of paper bags and old rags and garbage bags, okay, but, but have N95 masks, have protective gear, protective gowns, gloves, such that they actually can, can treat the residents and don't do so without risk of getting ill themselves. Okay, Rob, I remembered. Um, so uh, over the over on Sunday, um, Governor Lamont mentioned something about um, uh, basically providing civil immunity sort of to to um, any nursing homes that were involved uh, in COVID response efforts. Can you speak to that? Have you gotten any more information on what that entails? I, I don't have current uh, information on, on, on that statement by the governor. Uh, what I would say is that, that again, um, that, that there needs to be much more effective partnering uh, and, and resourcing from the state with the industry, with us as a union, uh, to be able to get these facilities the, the resources that they need. Uh, and up until this point, that has not happened. And, and uh, the action cannot wait until next week. Uh, there needs to be a, a massive increase in funding of the type that I, I uh, talked about, $150 uh, per resident. Uh, per day, which would amount to a 60 to 80 percent increase is something on the order of that is necessary because I think to, that to retain staff, we're going to have to do something like double wages uh, to be able to get workers to come into these facilities where it is known that they are, they are vectors of transmission uh, to deal with the existing staffing crisis um, and to make sure that, that we can, uh, pr the state, that the state can provide additional support for workers to cover healthcare costs because, again, hundreds of nursing home workers are going to get ill uh, and it is going to drive some of those families into medical bankruptcy uh, if they do not have the ability to get their medical care uh, and medical bills dealt with. Uh, and when we know that they're taking a, a, a tremendous risk uh, for themselves um, and that we are, as a society are asking them to do so. Um, I was wondering if any of the, the workers might want to talk about the idea regarding um, these homes that are just going to be dedicated to COVID patients, what their thoughts are about that. Hi. 
Um, can you repeat the question, please? The governor is considering, they're supposed to be talking about certain homes that are only going to have COVID-19 patients. What do you think about that? Not hearing you. Can you guys hear me now? Okay, that's better. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. I was, the governor's talking about having homes that only have COVID positive patients. What do you think about that idea? And have you heard about it happening where you were? Um, I didn't hear about it actually from my facility specifically, but my thoughts were scared because we don't have equipment. Like this isn't about, it, it isn't completely about money, but we need to have the necessary equipment to be able to care for these people. We need to be able to go to work and feel safe. We need to be able to feel protected. And we don't want to bring this home to our families. Like we have people at home. You know, I personally, how things are going right now, I don't want to work in a COVID only building. I don't feel safe. Is the uh, is the state offering you any assistance whatsoever? It's my understanding that if you were to be designated a COVID positive facility, that would come with a boost in funding and possibly supplies. Um, so is is the state offering you any assistance? I haven't gotten any confirmation on assistance. But why should we have to wait for an increase in supplies for a COVID building? We have people that are symptomatic and we need to be protected now. Yes, the company does get an increase in funding, but where is that funding going? Because we haven't had any signs of it going to the workers. We need to be protected or the funding is not relevant. And based on the how contagious this virus is and the way that it transmits, by the time that people are symptomatic, what it means is that there's multiple cases in every single facility. So the workers need the protective gear now. The, the main uh, priority for the extra funding is protective gear. And to the extent that it goes to wages, it's to make sure that, that a workforce can be retained that's adequate to care for the number of sick residents per facility. Uh, how are you doing on uh, not only PPE, but cleaning supplies? I wanted to ask you about that. And I'm also interested to know when, obviously you have an elderly population, when one of those residents becomes sick, um, do they stay in the nursing home or is it more likely that they get transported out to a hospital where they can receive a higher level of care? If we can care for them at the bedside in the facility, then we do so. We would only send them out if they were completely compromised. Um, and as far as cleaning supplies, as soon as um, COVID came about, cleaning supplies started disappearing. Um, our supply person literally started taking things off of the unit. Things started to become hidden. You know, we things we had access to we don't have as much access to now. Um, although we do have a few supplies, it is very limited. And we've never had to do, you know, nursing like this, and it is scary. Have you also had to fashion sort of like PPE? Have you had to fashion um, cleaning supplies out of like rubbing alcohol or, or other sanitizers that you can find or? Well, our facility gave us a small container of sanitizer that we have access to refill it while we're at work. So we, we do have access to sanitizer. And of course, um, hand washing, at least. Is that, is Dave Major trying to get in for a question or, or no?
We we can't hear you, Dave. Are there any other questions? Going once, your other question. Going twice. Okay. Uh, I want to thank all of the media that have been here, and most importantly, uh, the yeah. workers who are the true heroes of this crisis. Uh, and it's been incredibly, incredible sacrifices to take care of our health. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.